very pleased to welcome Renee Sherman to the stage with me. Renee is uh, with Bank of America, and he is here to speak to us about the power of APIs and their role in our future of, of growth and innovation. So, Renee, thank you. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> so, we have about half an hour and 80 slides. You're awake. Very good. Oops, that went a little bit fast. All right, <clears throat> so I think why we're doing what we're doing, why as a bank we're looking at APIs, I think there were some uh, sessions, particularly yesterday, I heard Falk Rieker talk about this a little bit as well, some of the trends that we see in the market, trends in the industry. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna walk through all of these topics, obviously, but I think some of the trends are very obvious and very clear as part of our lives. I think this is probably, at least for me, one of the first real events that I'm part of since uh, we've had, of course, the pandemic, so a lot of behavioral and global climate changes, uh, geopolitical events that are affecting us. But particularly if you look at the socioeconomic, the regulation and technology, we have a lot of changes that we need to navigate. For example, at Bank of America, um, out of our total technology budget, about 67% is being spent on regulatory compliance items. So before we even get to do any fun things, this is what we spend our money on, trying to just keep uh, compliant with our regulators. <clears throat> but what drives kind of all of these trends is that there is a certain agility and a certain speed that is expected from us. And not just from us as a bank, but obviously us as a bank servicing some of you as our clients. I know some of you are peers of Bank of America. Uh, we constantly get pressure to do things faster, get more insights, richer data, and try to really drive that uh, forward for our clients. So where that leads us to is the kind of the whole idea of the concept of on-time treasury. <clears throat> and even though I look after our API capabilities at Bank of America, it's, I think, important to keep in mind that not everything needs to be really real-time. APIs do not have to really transact real-time. Now, the information exchange itself may be real-time, but what you do with that information and where it fits into the overall cycle of you driving your business making insightful uh, reports, doing your analytics is a very different thing. So at Bank of America, we're very much focused on what we call on-time treasury. And really just trying to make sure that as we help our clients and as we interact with other institutions around us, that we make very deliberate decisions on how we do that. If you look at, for example, um, supplier payments, they're negotiated at term, you probably only pay them once a month. Companies sit on those invoices, there really is no point in trying to pay those transactions real time. But before you start dispersing that vendor file, it would be very helpful to have a real time view of what's the balance in my account. So we're anticipating the change, right, from batch to continuous workflows, real time demands, and we're driving capabilities there. And in some markets, we're being driven, we're being regulated, right? Look at Hong Kong, how seemingly overnight we lost the ACH network and is being replaced with faster payment services. We have the on-demand um, capability. And that's, I think, a lot about refresh. I think I've set in on some sessions uh, around how it's so important to get access to data. And I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, right? We've all heard analysis paralysis. But I think it's also very important that you keep very focused on, well, what exactly is the data that you need to have access to? Some of our clients ask us, give me all the data that you have we can barely get through it. I'm not sure what our clients wanna do with all that data. It's not always purposeful, right? So you have to also think about what is it that you want to measure? What are some of the KPIs you wanna define? Cash flow forecasting is something that we're very much focused on right now. And we're trying to do it in a way that it's purposeful and meaningful, meaning try and give updates, push notifications, alerts, through some of the API capabilities so that we can give a truthful perspective of what's really going on. The always on component sounds a bit strange, right? Because we're all shopping at Amazon and we're watching Netflix 24 seven, never is down for banks. This is still a massive change that we need to complete. And it's not just up to the banks. Um, it's also down to the regulatory uh, compliance that we need to meet as well. Our regulators need to be comfortable with us doing things truly 24 by seven. We also have to think about how do we handle some of our clearing interfaces. Not every transaction can settle 
within 24 hours. And we have to look at our technology. And obviously, you know, here at an SAP, SAP Pioneer event, there's a lot of exciting technology. Unfortunately, we also have a lot of technology that is not exciting. It's old school. We're still having mainframes. We're still having batch processes. We still run a tape backup device uh, because compliance dictates that we do that for the next five years. That is not always on. Uh, runs in a generator. Hopefully, it stays always on. Um, and then it's all about being continuously informed. And I think this goes a little bit back to some of the data, some of the reporting. Um, and what we're really trying to do more and more is to give that exact insight into what's happening. I think one of the most addictive features that people have, for example, with online shopping is not the shopping experience itself, but tracking the package. When is it being shipped? When is it on the truck? Is it down my street um, or with the Uber app? And we're trying to, of course, get into that on the banking side as well, but more focused on what's happening to my payment, what's happening to the transaction. Single biggest complaint we get is the beneficiary claims either non-receipt of the funds or you ended up paying something that they were not expecting. There could be lifting fees, there could be FX being applied. And what we're trying to do is provide more and more insights into what's happening. And it's not just us providing the insight, but also being reactive. So opening up our platform, allowing our clients through APIs, in some cases that might even uh, be driven fueled by chatbots, um, by online chat, to just give that insight into what's happening. So we have a lot of building blocks, a lot of things that we need to focus and move on. Um, as you can tell, our laundry list of items that we need to work on is uh, obviously quite long. And I think, again, some of the sessions yesterday, um, I think a lot of people were touching up on all the different uh, components that were listed there as well. And we have to find ourselves, not only how do we manage and handle that data today, where is it stored, is it trapped, meaning is it part of either a system deployment, is it part of a legal entity, is it in a different country where we may not be able to repatriate, retrieve some of that data. Sounds abstract, but obviously with financial regulations, it's um, easier said than done. Or we now have the trend for the opposite. Uh, if we look at a market like India, we are required to store our data for transactions that touch Indian accounts or Indian nationals in India. Cloud is great, but when you're in a hybrid model, like many of the banks are, partially cloud, partially on-prem, that presents a very unique challenge. We have to completely dissect our application's infrastructure and be ready for that. Um, bank reporting and reconciliation. Um, Bank reporting is a little bit of a double-edged thing here for us. It's not only us reporting to our clients as a bank, we have to provide reporting as well. We have our own regulatory compliance reporting that we need to do, and regulators, uh, governing entities need more richer data constantly around the clock. And we've all heard about the stress tests the bank are subject to. These tests are really becoming on steroids as well. They're no longer fill out a big spreadsheet and send it over. Our regulators want to really start tapping into our platforms live and start monitoring uh, our transactions and, and our platforms. But I think um, the fun is really on the bottom three right there in the middle, reporting and performance management, analytics and diagnostics and data management. And I think this is where, if I think back to the uh, keynotes that Paolo gave earlier this morning about how we need to change our thinking on how banks and institutions and companies need to deal with data and present it. This is where we have our single biggest investments. Uh, and this is where we're really trying to rethink and readjust how do we handle data. So at Bank of America, we launched a, um, a data management office about five years ago. And the biggest single task was, can we get an inventory of all the data that we have? And um, it was a big surprise. We had a lot more data than what we knew we have. We also had a lot of the same data sitting in multiple different places. I think banks on average keep record of everything in average nine different spots. I think I've seen some research being done. We're guilty of some of that as well. So we had to weed out duplicates. We had to, <clears throat> in case of conflict, find out what is really the truthful record and then starting to mine that data, uh, not to sell it to companies and uh, use it in our advantage, but trying to really figure out what can we do with this data? What insights can we derive? And this is where, as an institution, we're really trying to help our clients with working capital. Can we make our clients insightful? What is their cash position? What are the assets and the liabilities that they have? 
Do we see incoming funds? Can we predict outgoing flows based on historical data? And can we then start putting together some recommendations, some advices on what they should be anticipating? Maybe based on behavior, we can recommend setting up an intercompany loan, or maybe you need to draw down on the revolver and make sure you're liquid. Or if you're rich on cash inflow, start thinking about some overnight investment opportunities. Um, and that's where a lot of the data that we're driving is really all about making that more insightful for our clients. Back to reporting and performance management. I think one of the things that we're also trying to really sort out is there, how can we really truly work as a always on bank? Um, we have Zelle, we have Venmo, we have all these networks that are available 24 by seven, but it creates very interesting challenges. Previous day reporting or you know, a BI2 or an MT 940 it was nice. The branch closed, we close our books, we go offline, we run our fetch cycles, we do interest calculations, and we're done. In a real-time world, what does that mean? We probably need to cut off at midnight, but do you cut off at midnight, or do you cut off at 23, 59 minutes and 59 seconds? And when do you determine the interest calculations? Depending on where you do it, the volatility of the market, it could make some differences. And we may be out of sync with our clients on how we allocate interest allocations, um, let alone if there are some FX components that are involved with this as well. So we have to continuously rethink and refigure out how we need to do this. And obviously we cannot figure this out just by ourselves. It's something that we need to do um, as an industry. So the key to all of this is to really start looking very carefully at APIs. And APIs is really not just for us to interact with our clients, with external partners, but we're working a lot with different vendors, providers, ERP, TMS platforms. We're working with um, integrated networks that are out there. We're working with other banks, but even internally, we're really looking at um, leveraging and using APIs more efficiently and effectively. And I think the benefits of API probably have already been um, pretty straightforward, but the challenge is to actually make them work in a financial services environment. Because we have so many constraints, sometimes feel like you're trying to drive the car with every regulator's foot on the brake, not to be able to really advance. We have to navigate all of that. And the second real big challenge that we have is the lowest common denominator. In some markets, we are not allowed to do certain things that we would love to do virtual account management, for example, and being able to allow our clients to manage accounts real time online is often restricted. And we have to build in timers. It's like an NFL game with a 10 second delay, to make sure nothing nasty happens. But it is that whole shift from the traditional banking to the real time banking model. And it's all about getting to that on demand data. So, how does that really work and how does that really fit out? <clears throat> this is kind of an anonymous slide. Um, there are, of course, many different components in it that we use and that we work with, but we're trying to really build a bridge between how our clients are organized or constructed, how to use some of their platforms and application, and how on our end, we are using our infrastructure, our solutions to best service them. So in the middle, you can kind of see all of these different APIs, and this is like a subset of the APIs that we support. But this is all about us trying to make it easier for our clients to basically treat us or see us as an embedded bank. Um, ultimately, to bring in all of these capabilities directly into their software application of choice, treasury applications, SAP, and transact, manage their books, and of course, on the other side of the equation, if you were to look more towards the left of that, many of our clients are part of another more complex ecosystem. Um, when you start thinking about, for example, supply finance uh, being part of a more complex model. And of course, we're also trying to find ways that we can reach beyond just the entity or corporate client and assist them, advise them and support them with procurement processes, working with raw material uh, consumption, invoice management um, so, not that, sorry, so that they do not have to switch to a banking portal or have to call a help desk, but trying to really do this. And of course, the key is that end-to-end -end data exchange driven by APIs. It also means for our strategic partnerships, right? We have to look at who do we do business with. 
with whom can we partner and how can we embed that. The single largest challenge that we have to navigate in all of this is not to do all of this API stuff. It's where all of these little arrows end. And in Bank of America's world, Cash Pro is our, is our connectivity platform that we have for our clients, online, mobile, file, Swift, API. We now need to think about storing all of that data. And we need to do that in not only a safe and a protected way, but do it in a way that we can go back to it and help our clients digest, analyze, understand that data so that they can then again use it in their advantage for further decision making. Because very often, our clients have just as a complex infrastructure um, as, as we do as a bank, right? Through mergers and acquisitions, different versioning, uh, different controls, it becomes a very complex, challenging environment to navigate. So that's where we're really trying to drive that on-time world engagement Last but not least, something to, of course, keep in mind. I've not called them APIs in this slide. They're more business functions. In some cases, our clients are perfectly fine using a more traditional way of exchanging that information, that data, sending in a file or downloading a large file, large report. Um, I think some of the things that we still need to kind of figure out, I think, as an industry is one is standardization. There are no real dominant standards yet when it comes to the world of APIs. There's a lot of industry initiatives. Swift is trying to drive uh, some standardization. Uh, NACHA here in the US is trying to advance that as well, but I think that's all in a very early uh, immature stages. Um, but also it's not yet a real true workhorse. There are some limitations that we have to still navigate with API, but I kind of compare it to, you know, Look where Netflix was just a couple of years ago, right? The whole idea that in multiple rooms in my house, people would be streaming movies and gaming at the same time was ridiculous, right? We'll get that little red CD-ROM delivered into mailbox. I forced my kids to be in the room. We're gonna enjoy watching a movie. Um, these days, they're all sitting on their own devices, multiple devices, gaming and streaming at the same time. And the internet bandwidth is not an issue. It's perfectly fine. Um, it's amazing really how quickly and easy that has gotten that way in just a couple of years. With financial APIs, we're not quite there yet. You know, again, back to those vendor and supplier payments, it's still better to send them over as a file because the amount of data that we are asked to move at one point in time, yeah, you could do it through APIs, but you know, not only would our API gateway be clogged, our clients cannot send it to us that fast. So we have to figure that out. It's going to evolve, but I'm not surprised if in a couple of years, we're not even really talking about files anymore and everything gets broken down. It's gonna be used just as APIs and, and use real-time transactions. So I had a little slide in here around case studies because I get very often asked, well, that's great, APIs in financial service, who cares, how does it really work? How does it help you? <laughs> um, so trying to just give a couple of examples. Um, I think the first one there on the left around working capital um, was an insurance client of ours. And um, it was a rather simple task, but very challenging for them to solve. And it was all about, like I mentioned before, working capital. Just to know where are their funds? Can they use some of those funds for other purposes? Are they liquid enough? Um, are they collecting enough on policies that they've sent out? And by switching from a file-based solution to APIs, they were able to um, accelerate that insight in, by basically running a day behind now they're feeling they're running about an hour behind reality. They're getting a lot of more real-time insights. And that has allowed them to optimize their working capital. And this particular client was able to free up funds and do some acquisitions just because they have better insights and therefore grow their business. Um, second one is all about reconciliation, a transportation company. Um, it's actually a railway company. And they were just struggling with reconciliation. They had companies being paid by check. They got at all kinds of different banking relationships, different banking solutions, even within one bank. Um, we consolidated it, we're using APIs, we're pulling that data from different sources and we're providing that to them real time. So that by the time that they sign a contract for a transportation request to the moment that they get it paid, they can now follow that entire life cycle. And they can also better manage their uh, accounts. They were discovering that they had some relationships where they ran delinquent relationships. Companies were never paying or were not paying ever on time, even though they were promised rewarded discounts. 
um, by, by paying on certain terms. By having that insight, they could renegotiate. It was good for their business, I suppose. Um, we also have a, a charitable organization. Um, it's for National Guard members. When they graduate from the National Guard, um, they often need help um, finding jobs or finding placements. Uh, some of them may need, for example, some wellness health, right? Uh, find, find some medical, medical uh, wellness health. And they have a website. You could apply online. These Guard members can apply for everything, housing help, for example. But then the frustration is the check is in the mail. And that would take a long time. We've switched that out. Now they're using Zelle. The moment the application is approved, we get the instruction, we immediately move funds, and that Guard member right there in the office after completing the application also gets the funds. And that has helped them uh, provide better stability for that group of servicemen and um, uh, has helped them with uh, overall better approach. The last one is uh, a gig economy client um, struggling to find drivers and deliverers because they were paying them with checks on site. There was a lot of fraud, so they switched to traditional payroll. Generation Z or whatever the latest number is that we're at, um, did not really like it because competitors were paying instantly. So again, also switching to a different model, but not only just allowing to pay out through a real-time payment type, but also using some of the token validations, right? If you're on Zelle or Venmo, your phone number and the email address, and there was a lot of issues with the correctness of it. Um, so they're not only using APIs to pay out, they're using APIs as well to also validate that that token for that instant payment is correct and accurate. And that has helped them retain more clients. They're one of the more um, appreciated um, gig economy business in the regions where they operate. And of course, at Bank of America, we mostly support uh, corporate clients, but that doesn't mean that we also do not get involved in B2C or business to consumer type of flows. So one of the things that we are involved with is pay by bank. To just give you a little bit of an example of how things work a little bit different. So we can help our clients. Um, typical use cases, for example, what you see in different markets, you buy something online, you have the option to pay by credit card, but you could also pay by bank accounts. So when you use the pay by bank solution, we can push a notification to the bank of where the consumer is having a bank account. That bank will then trigger an alert. We will pass it on to the user, and the user can authorize that transaction in their app, and we help our customers collect funds. It's not a uh, traditional collection instrument because the end user needs to authenticate to their own bank to approve the release of the funds, but we're prompting and facilitating that whole information exchange so that our clients can uh, have the same, like, credit card-like experience instead of processing your credit card and get that instant feedback that everything is working well. Now they have that pay by bank solution and they get the notifications. And this is also a solution where we're using a lot of traditional payments, like a traditional deposit into a bank account. So the upside of it is no interchange costs and no chargebacks as you typically have with credit cards, but also a direct possession of the funds, relatively speaking. It's usually um, end of day cycle, right? So it's really truly available next day, but it's a better experience than using a credit card. We have to wait 30, 60 days before you actually get the physical deposit of the funds. So APIs are, I think, really the future of financial services, but probably in ways that we have not imagined. Um, it's not my own doing. I stole this from someone else, but I'll claim it as my Victoria's idea. But it's a little timeline and the whole concept of an idea of APIs was already conceived in 1951, right? We didn't even really have the level of sophistication in computers that we had today, but there was a book published, The Preparation of Programs for an Electronic Digital Computer. Kind of an insightful title, but you know, if you also think back to the rise of the internet, APIs were driving a lot of that. Um, we call them RPCs, but really effectively an RPC is an API, right? Small, simple, succinct instructions, and you get a binary response to it. Um, Salesforce, first financial services API, took another seven years and about 111 banks started adopting APIs. And I think right now the number is there, right? There's over 1,600 open banking platforms and I think that number is even um, a little bit too low. There have been more and more platforms that are emerging, 
particularly in Latin America and in APAC. Um, but also there's a scan was being done by, I believe, Accenture. There's over 5,600 different financial services products, unique financial service products that are available through API. And that's, of course, barely scratching their service. There's a lot more possible, but um, that's really kind of fascinating, right? If, if you could put it in a graph, I'm sure it would be a very steep graph. Um, but on that topic, and I think this is where we're going to see the biggest changes is around open banking and embedded finance. Open banking more in the sense of not so much it's anywhere every time. Um, it's more a matter of making it easier for anyone to communicate and interact with any bank uh, to try and get information data reporting, but also streamline that exchange of not only financial data, but also financial uh, transactions. And then the embedded finance, right? Going back to that pay by bank example that I had on the other slide, there's no Bank of America logo on that at all. It's just us helping our clients. If anything, our client's logo is on there, but it's us as a bank putting some technology and some capabilities out there that help our clients run their business better. And I think it's an interesting thing that we're gonna probably see happening, but kind of looking for some new ecosystem type capabilities that are going to be emerging and creating. Um, we need some standardization to drive that and make that happen, but I think eventually by getting into better ecosystems, working based on standards and being part of logical networks, meaning for example, if you think of a company, let's, let's say Target or a Walmart, how they are in the midst of so many suppliers of goods and services, they are in their own right providers of, of goods and services, they employ hundreds of thousands of people, it, it becomes a very vast, expensive network when you start thinking about it. They hire from temp agencies, and it just keeps growing bigger and bigger. And we need to find ways to, of course, keep that information flowing directly, easily, seamlessly. And eventually, is to really bring that data decision-making all in-house, even though it might all be running in clouds and it might be powered and driven by APIs. But I think we need to really try and find ways to really push the technology complexity out of it and really enable and empower um, our customers and anyone really to feel and, and be in control of that data. And APIs are going to be, be driving it. And that was my last slide, not 80. Anybody have any questions? I'm happy to answer any questions. I think there was a hand, but the light is directly in my eyes. <laughs> Hello. Uh, do you have any other integration with other channels rather than PayPal? That you show PayPal? Sure. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of different networks out there. So Bank of America is involved with PayPal, Zelle, Venmo here in the US. Um, in Canada, we've, we're bringing Indirect uh, up and running. In Europe, we've got uh, SEPA Instant Credits and in different markets in Asia, uh, Hong Kong Fast Payments, Indonesia BiFast, India UPI. Uh, there's more and more of these real-time networks emerging. Some of them are um, account to account. Some of them are payments into wallets. Um, but we evaluate and assess all of the different options that we have. We're not going to be part of all of them. We're going to have to follow what our clients need us to be part of. And we also, of course, have to also make sure that, you know, we manage our risk. Uh, some wallets are better managed than others, right? Great. Thank you. Sure. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Pretty good presentation. Thanks. One quick question. Are you monetizing from the use of APIs or is it your plans to charge the customers for the use of the information? It's a very, very good question, and I didn't mean to laugh at it. Um, right now, we do not charge for APIs itself. We charge for the services that we provide. So if you need to have uh, a data report, a balance uh, inquiry through an API, that's the service that we charge for. If you want to make a payment, if it's a FET wire, we charge you the FET wire fee. If it's a, an ACH transfer, we charge the ACH fee. We do not today charge for APIs in and of itself. Um, that may change in the future. Um, that's something that we're continuously assessing. I think 
It also goes back a little bit to the whole embedded finance model. We're also very conscious that we do not want to make it too hard or too complex to raise barriers. In other words, as you're watching, for example, Netflix on your MacBook, right? Apple's not going to charge you for watching Netflix on the MacBook, even though they probably want you to watch Amazon Prime. They're not going to get their hands into it. Um, we have to be very conscious of that as well. But then again, as we build more and more services and functions, well, of course, sooner or later, we're going to be stumbling upon value-added services, insights that we can create that are not possible through human interaction or they're not possible through other channels. And they may become productized and therefore an opportunity to monetize. But at the same time, if we can drive our clients' questions and queries about what happened to my payments to use APIs and not pick up a phone and not occupy call center time, it's more cost effective for us to keep that API free than to try and charge for it because then they're going to call the call center and call center staff is more expensive than having an API respond to an inquiry. So I hope that answered your question. I have a very red box, so I think I probably need to wrap it up. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate so it. So much. Very insightful.